So welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Torres, and I'm currently serving as the president of the Monotype Guild of New England. And I'm going to be serving as the moderator uh, today and later on in our Q&A. Um, on behalf of the Guild, I want to thank you first for joining us for this virtual artist talk with uh, Carol McDonald. Um, we have artists joining us from not only the United States, but beyond, uh, possibly from Australia and England. So we just wanted to shout out and say welcome. Um, I'm joining you tonight from my home in Cambridge, Mass. And I like to begin tonight by acknowledging the indigenous cultures of New England. And I join you from the ancestral homeland of the Massachusetts people and the Wampanoag tribe. I would like to recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. This land is a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. And so in that tradition, we look forward to our meeting and exchange with you all tonight. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Monotype Guild of New England, we are a volunteer-run nonprofit printmaking organization consisting of 250 contemporary artists creating unique impressions by working in the mediums of monotype and monoprint. None of our board members or volunteers are paid, so all of the amazing work that we do, including, including our virtual free programming, like tonight's artist talk, is purely done as a labor of love and funded primarily by our membership dues, donations, and the submission fees from our exhibitions. So I just wanna take the time tonight to thank all of our loyal members and volunteers who've donated their time and worked tirelessly to keep this organi organization not only running, but growing and thriving. Founded in 1985 by a small group of New England artists in the Cape of Massachusetts, the Guild has expanded to be a national organization which has cur curated over 200 exhibitions across New England. While our current exhibitions are on hold for the time being, we are excited to launch our new virtual programming this summer and have a wide range of upcoming artist talks, artist meetups, and other events scheduled this fall. So please go to our website at mgne.org for more information about upcoming events. So a few uh, logistics for tonight. We have all of your microphones muted for the presentation. The virtual tour and presentation today will last approximately 40 minutes. And then we're gonna dedicate the last 15 minutes to question and answer period. Um, and while I'm going to do my best to get to every question, we do have a large group joining tonight, so I might not be able to address them all, but please feel free to email us as well. Um, I would encourage you, if you like, to go ahead during the presentation and put your questions and comments in the chat room. The chat room is actually um, set so that all comments and questions go directly to the host, which is me, just to minimize the distraction. So feel free to drop them into the chat room and then I'll try to help answer them. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the MGE artist who will be providing tonight's talk. Carol McDonald is a printmaker living and working in Vermont. She has been an artist fellow at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts and the Vermont Studio Center. Her work is in many private museum and corporate collections. She opens her studio for monthly monoprint workshops and currently serves as the MGE board on the MGE board as a membership chair, and she's also been the chair of our task force has handled all our new virtual programming. We are delighted to have Carol provide us a virtual tour of her critically acclaimed exhibition, Mending Fences, New Works by Carol McDonald, currently on view at the Rokeby Museum of Vermont through October 25th, 2020. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Carol. Hello, hi there. Um, I am thrilled to be here and be doing this talk. Um, the way I thought I would structure it is I'm going to tell you first a bit about how I got involved with this project. Um, and then I have a, am I frozen? I have a video um, that I will show that um, Catherine Brooks, the executive director, shot of me talking um, in the exhibition. Um, and then we're going to go to a PowerPoint um, talk where I'll bring you into my studio and really talk more in depth about some of the prints that um, I made. So in that, so we'll get started. Um, I got involved with the Ropey Museum through my um, good friend and curator, um, Rick Cassini Cador who started a project a couple of years ago with, in partnership with the Rokeby called Contemporary Art um, at Rokeby. 
Um, the purpose of that program was to engage artists and the public with Rokeby archives, objects, buildings, and the land, and to engage um, and to really speak to how contemporary art can pick up the unfinished work of history and foster civic engagement in social, economic, and environmental justice issues. Rick curated two shows. Um, one was Rokeby Through the Lens, which talked about photography, and another was the Structures, which really talked about the buildings. Um, and in that, in that show, he actually had not only local artists, but a piece by Yoko Ono. The other critical piece of this program was something called the Art Lab, where um, we, Artists Applied, it was a four-day program that took place a year ago um, at Rokeby. And it was a chance for artists to really learn how to access the archives of Rokeby um, and do research into the institution. And out of that, think about a project and make a proposal for a project that would be funded by Rokeby. So I went in um, having spent the last 10 years working um, with art source from knitting that I make, thinking, well, probably it was a sheep farm. Um, they raised merino sheep there, and it will probably have something to do with knitting. But as I got involved with um, the history of Rokeby, uh, this idea of repair um, came to mind and really um, took hold for me as a way to make art and be able to work on many, many, many levels um, in terms of my own personal work, but you know, to think about personal healing, societal healing, um, and um, environmental. So with that, I am going to see if I can launch this video. So we shot this video um, a couple of weeks ago. And it, in it, I, I speak um, about some of the pieces in the show. Okay, so here we go. Hello, I'm Carol McDonald, and we are here at the Rokeby Museum in Ferrisburg, Vermont, for my exhibition, Mending Fences. Um, the Rokeby Museum was farmsteaded and homesteaded by the Robinsons for four generations from the 1700s into the 1900s. And um, it was also the second generation were abolitionists, so it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And when it was left as a museum, um, it was to be preserved, not necessarily restored, but preserved. So my interest became in this idea of repair um, and the idea that a farm and a homestead relied on both being able to make things, make tools, make home goods, sew clothing, but also to be able to repair them. And, and having that sense of hand in, in things, um, beloved objects, etc. And the other um, piece for me was that abolition was a repair in society for a long, and um, so that there's that heritage that lives on, on this land, in this, in this um, place. And one of the catalysts, actually, for me, were these spoons that um, Thomas Robinson had made um, hand carving out of wood. And when they broke, somebody in the family took and drilled them and then sewed them back together. Um, so I had this idea about repair 
Um, and we went up in the attic and found boxes of broken pottery. And um, so thinking about the, the idea of kintsugi, which is a Japanese way of repairing um, ceramics, where they actually use gold in the line, I decided to use red as my unifying color in all of the work that I was going to repair. So this um, porcelain bowl is um, repaired with a reversible glue and then also acrylic paint, red acrylic paint. And I love the flow of that line um, as it, you know, goes through the ceramics there. <clears throat> Um, wrote the um, deaccessioned some clothing and some textiles to me to work with and to make a series of monoprints. Um, I'm a primarily a printmaker and I have done actually quite a bit of work um, with clothing as imagery. Um, I was interested in these to have a sense of presence and feel like portraits of the clothing itself and of that time. Um, this particular piece, um, the lace blouse, was from the Rokey collection and it came to me in four parts. Um, the cuffs and the collar were all separate. Um, one of the sleeves wasn't sewn. Um, the the um, placard wasn't ever finished, so, um, but it had this beautiful lace on it with colors in the lace. And um, so in making this print, I was interested in, you know, pulling that lace out. And it was also very torn up in here. And so I actually took pieces of fabric from another garment and made those repairs in the print and sewed that piece of fabric in there. Um, another piece that came from Rofi was um, this blue bodice, which was a beautiful blue, deep blue color and had padded um, shoulders and yoke and um, with very intricate beadwork that had all been hand sewn on. And, you know, it's important to remember that all of these pieces of clothing were handmade, all of the stitches, they, they didn't have sewing machines at that point. Um, and so in making these prints, I take a big plate, plexiglass plate, and roll, roll it with ink, um, a layer of ink, and then take the garment and put it face down on the plate and run it through my etching press. And, um, and then pull the garment off. And what I'm working with to make these prints is the ink that's left on the plate. So in all of these, I had to then wipe the ink off of the plate around the garment um, to really isolate it, and then work with what I had when this went through the press, you know, it had all of these beads and there's a lot of pressure in the press. So I could hear them all popping and um, snapping as they were breaking. Um, so I had to pick a lot of beads actually out of the ink before I printed it. Um, <clears throat> and then was able to take and run, run the plate back through the press with a piece of paper to, to print the image onto the paper and then I worked with it from there. In this particular piece, um, I there were these big holes, one was right here, and, and I decided to take some of the beads that had broken off and sew it back into this area with the pattern of the beads, um, as you could see evidence in the, the pattern up here. Um, and then also fill in this shoulder up here. Um, this was a taffeta fabric, so the fabric 
was just really falling apart. And there are quite a few places here where you can see holes. And, you know, I was thinking about repair and that there are parts of our lives, there are some things that are beyond repair. And so I actually decided to not try to mend absolutely everything, but to, to leave um, those tears there to show that wornness. And in this garment, the blue bodice, I discovered um, these, this, the lining, came out of that blue bodice. And um, it was made of cotton and beautifully tailored. Um, the stitch work was impeccable. And um, interestingly enough, it had short sleeves that were like just sort of torn off and worn off. Um, in this piece, I took and repaired one of the places with a piece of Japanese rice paper that I sewed in and then um, also sewed into these two places where things were torn. And so this was the front of it, and then this is the back of it. And I, I just really love this little hem and um, this opening into this inside. And also the, you know, just the beautiful way that it was tailored. So these two pieces are made from a small ch child's dress. Um, it was, well, this is the size of it, that a young child would have worn. Um, it was heavily stained, the fabric, um, but the fabric was in fairly good shape, although it did have a couple of holes in it. Um, I love, what I loved about this garment was the gathering here and the lace, this beautiful, delicate lace around the sleeves and the collar. And um, so in finding a way to repair this, I found this little flower piece of lace that I sewed on. It was all white or off-white, and then I decided it needed some color, so I actually went in with a needle and thread and um, brought some of the red into that, and then again made another patch on this one with another piece of lace. And So there's a playfulness for me about those two repairs, and then I sewed the button back on that I had taken off to print it. And um, these bonnets were beautiful. This one, I mean, they were very, very fragile fabric um, and really falling apart. But you can see the structure um, that all of this netting was on. And then it had this beautiful um, satin ribbon that, um, so I like the juxtaposition of these two pieces. And this piece, um, the beaded overdress, was a um, really interesting piece to work with. It was this very sheer white overdress that you would have worn to a party. Um, and sort of Egyptian style with this funny little cutout in the back um, and with beads all the way around it. Um, and it was, the fabric literally was falling apart. And so I inked my plates and I knew that I had like one shot with this garment. And sure enough, I, you know, inked the plate, put it down, ran it through the press. And as I started to pull it off, the fabric just disintegrated. And um, I actually spent hours picking fabric off of the plate. And there were some places where I couldn't get it off at all. So, um, you know, I cleaned the plates off and printed it, um, and I had big white areas where the fabric had stuck into the ink and wouldn't let the ink come through. 
So very much like um, renovating a house or um, I realized I had this new structure for this garment that had sort of disintegrated. And I decided to bring um, almost like a skin, some of the fabric back into the print itself um, and collage that on. Um, and then take this um, pile of beads that I had, this tape of beads, and sew it back onto the print so that it would actually um, but having those jewels um, be part of the piece. And um, it was quite a commitment to sew those beads back on. It took me about three and a half days of sewing. And then um, all during the, being the lockdown of coronavirus, um, my husband and I spent quite a few evenings um, watching TV and this was a runner that I had that had been worn and had holes all throughout it. And so I decided that instead of trying to pull the holes together, that I would just make them even bigger and sew around them and um, have that become a whole new design to sort of play off of this old lace pattern. And, um, and then I started actually making connecting lines and there's something for me um, very COVID about it. I call this the pandemic runner um, because these little shapes sort of remind me of this coronavirus that's running around. When I first went into the house at, um, at Brophy, the historic house, um, there was a net hanging on the wall that would, had a big hole in it. And um, in one of the bedrooms was this rug um, that also had big holes in it. So anywhere where it's red now, I um, took and filled that in myself. Um, and interestingly enough about, you know, when you're working with a rug and repairing it, um, you have to pick up the, the, uh, the warp, which are the red, white and black um, lines here, and weave the fabric through that, um, which was quite painstaking. The fabric I used was from an old dress of mine, um, sort of in honor of the, the historic nature of these rag rugs, which were made from scraps of old fabric. Um, and it was interesting also, you know, because I was thinking a lot about racial relationships um, while I did all of this work. And listen, I was listening to a lot of podcasts. And so, it was very interesting to me to have this play of like picking up the white and the black warps and um, weaving this red fabric through it. Um, this net, um, I've never made a net before and so I um, went to YouTube and, and watched quite a few how to make a net or how to repair a net. <laughs> Um, videos and um, got myself some needle shuttles and um, you know did a lot of practice runs and then um, finally cast on my stitches and um, made my made the net happen and then had to connect it to what was existing here thinking about you know that I was also gonna have to undo it at some point so we'll see they may decide to just keep it as <laughs> is. <laughs> and then this chair um, was another fascinating project. We found this in the shed and it was quite dirty. Um, the original seat was, um, were um, overalls that had been woven together and the back was a piece of floral fabric and um, when I took that off, um, there was caning underneath. So I picked up the pattern of the caning um, in 
this um, work that I did with the shaker tape. And then I went to Goodwill and I found a pair of red um, jeans and decided to incorporate the waistband into the top of this and also to add um, a pocket into the back because we always need a pocket in the back of our chair. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us here um, at the Rofi, and I hope you can come and um, see the exhibit in person. Um, it will be up through October 25th um, of 2020. So it's always amazing to watch yourself on video. It's very uncomfortable, but anyway. Um, so, now what we're going to do is um, go into the studio. And I'd just like to also have a, make a shout out to um, Catherine Brooks from Rokeby, who's the executive director, who's been a major collaborator with me in this project, and also Steve Weatherby, um, who did the exhibition design. And um, many thanks to a brilliant job in the um, the hanging of it in the installation and um, figuring all of those crazy pieces out. Um, so at this point, what I'm going to do is we're going to travel 25 miles north um, up to my house and studio. So I'm going to go back to screen share and get this slideshow going, OK? And go here. We can see it, Carol, so you're good. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, so this is when I wake up in the morning, I look down um, on my labyrinth and out onto the Winooski River. So I'm located here in Colchester, Vermont, um, the land of the Abenaki people. And I believe that they probably were on this piece of land at some point. Oops, oh, sorry, wait a minute. And um, this is the studio, which is across the lawn from my house, and also um, looks out on the river. And just a quick, for all of you artists, printmakers out there who love to see the inside of a studio, um, I have included a few studio shots um, of one of my major inking tables, um, big work table, counter space, going into the back where I've got drying racks and my two etching presses. And um, this is the main etching press that I use, which is a, um, was built by John Lingenfelder for Bare Naked Press in New River, Arizona. And, um, and closer to the window, you'll see another wheel, and that's a handmade press that my um, first husband built me and with an 18 by 36 inch bed made from old machine parts. So here's, um, this is when I was making these prints. Um, my back wall, I would hang them up and look at them and um, pull them down and work on them. And you can see um, some of the laces and, and fabrics underneath some of this. So I, I, I did make some in progress prints and um, or photographs. And so this is one of me inking up a plate um, for one of the, well, for the large um, skirt. And I use oil-based inks, um, mostly graphic chemical and ink, um, intaglio oil-based inks, um, etching inks. Um, 
some Gamblin and Charbonnel. And um, this was in the very early days of testing. And um, the ink here actually is quite a bit darker than what I ended up using. I ended up adding a lot of transparent base into, um, into, into the inks that I was using. So I would ink a plate, um, you know, which when you're working this large, I was printing on um, 30 by 44 inch Stonehenge paper. And um, this is one of the pieces. This actually was a skirt that I owned um, that was passed down to me. Um, I actually was, it was what I wore for my first wedding even. Um, so here it is ready to go through the press. And here is the plate after um, I've taken the skirt off of it and I'm starting to clean around um, the image with oils and rags and um, Q-tips. This, this was the long skirt, um, which you saw in the press. It, I had to go into most of these uh, with a lot of colored pencil. And in this case, um, with the lace, I actually went in with pen and ink, with white pen and ink, and really pulled that pattern up um, for that piece. Um, this was a pair of pantaloons, which are, have a wonderful split crotch, um, very um, great garment that women used to wear. Um, and so here it is after some amount of work, um, after it's been pulled. And then um, I went in even further with more um, colored pencils to um, define the garment more and then also added some stitching up here at the top um, where there was a tear in it and it had been repaired before. This was um, the first bonnet that I printed and you can see that the fabric is really, really, it's this fine, fine mesh and it had a huge amount of starch in it and I hadn't really considered that when I started printing this. So I inked a plate and I put it down and I pulled the piece of paper off and um, the bonnet actually stuck to the print because I print on um, damp paper. And I did have the presence of mind to photograph it and in many ways I wish I had just left it where it was but um, I pulled it off and um, ruined the garment in that, it, while doing that. And, but this is what was left for that print. And then this was the second bonnet. And so then I thought, well, I'm a smart rat. If there's that much starch in it, if I soak it, um, maybe it will not stick and um, it will work better. So I soaked it. And by the time um, I got it out, um, it, it then started sticking, still sticking to itself and really deteriorated even further. So, um, <laughs> so I, I inked a plate and I put um, this piece of paper down on it and ran it when I ran it through the press to get this impression and then um, took the, the bonnet off and, and this was left in the, on the plate. So I actually got two um, prints out of that piece. This was the um, lace blouse that I talked about in the video. And so this is the actual garment and you can see the cuffs and the collar and um, the sleeve was not um, sewn up. And so I actually spent quite a bit of time putting the garment together before I actually started to print with it. And um, I know I said in the video that when I repaired it, I used fabric from a different um, garment, but I realized 
when I saw this um, image that I used Garmin probably from the back of the, or the fabric from, from this garment to um, fix the print, to sew onto the print. But you can see the beautiful lace and the colors in it were really quite spectacular. Um, there's the cuff and the sleeve. And here you can see this is what it looked like after I had sent it through the press. So I had said earlier that um, the inks I ended up using were a lot more transparent and you can get a sense of that I think here when you see that ink um, going right through the through the um, through the plate. So when after I cleaned off the plate and printed it this is pretty much what I had um, and you can see up here where those holes were you know there wasn't a lot of definition and the other thing that happens a lot in these is that you get that x-ray um, thing where you see both the front and the back, um, which, is, which was something that um, I worked into, again, with colored pencil. You can see some of that in here to, um, to make the front come forward and the back go back. Um, and here, this is me sewing the fabric into the print. And here, um, working with colored pencils, I work a lot with Prismacolor. Um, and this was the actual garment here so that I could actually see what color went where in terms of the lace um, and coloring that and then also working into the, um, into the lace and into the body of the blouse. And I also use quite a bit of um, white ink, pen and ink on the lace to pull that up as well. So a lot of these prints took um, many, many hours of working into to have them read the way I wanted them to. This is the, um, the blue bodice. So you can see the disrepair, the state of disrepair that this um, piece was in. It had huge holes. Um, the the fabric was really falling apart, but, um, but the beadwork was really amazing. And of course I had to cut off all of the snaps and um, any big um, beads so that they didn't damage my press before printing. This is what the plate looked like when I took the garment off. Um, and you can see the amount of beads that are embedded in the ink. Um, and again, you can sort of see that x-ray thing that happens. So I cleaned the plate, um, which, you know, took quite a while, and then printed it. And this was, um, in this one, I had done some amount of work into it, but you can see that it, to, to make sense of the garment, um, I really needed to do quite a bit of work. So this is the final um, piece here. I always think it's sort of interesting to sort of see what it didn't look like, and then you know how it how I how I how it finally came out. Um, and again, you know, sewing the beads onto the piece. And this is the lining that I took out of the. Um, out of the piece, the front of it. And then this was the back of it. And you can see the, you know, it was a beautiful fabric and um, all hand sewn. This was the original print after I pulled it um, of the back. Is that the back? That is, no, that actually is, that is, okay. So that's the back. Um, and it, so I had to do quite a bit of work um, deepening this and, and these areas, um, again, to make the, the garment end up looking three-dimensional. 
And then this was the front when it was first pulled. And this is how it ended up um, again working into it and, um, and then sewing into it as well. And this little detail um, shows you the um, rice paper, Japanese rice paper that I stitched into it. And I think you can probably see the colored pencil um, to, to make that tonal difference so that you could um, read the garment. Um, this was the child's dress. As I had said, it was very heavily stained, um, but quite beautiful. And I'm sure it was worn by many, many children um, through the generations um, and washed, you know, hand washed many, many times. Um, that was the yoke. And here it was going through the press. Um, and I have to say that, you know, I, it took me quite a while to get the inks right. So some of these garments went through many, many times before I got the right quality of ink to even, to even work on the pieces. Um, here it is, and you can see um, the image of it in the ink, um, and then what the garment ended up looked like with ink on it. Um, and then the print itself, and this was sewing um, into that lace piece, which when I first put it on, it was just, it, it didn't do anything. And so it became really evident that I needed to bring that color into it to make it work. Um, and then the back of it, where I sewed the button on the top and and again, also had to go in and do quite a bit of work to get the lace to really read. This was a piece of um, a star shaped piece of a table um, piece of lace. And it had a lot of holes in it. Um, it was linen um, with this beautiful, incredible lace pieces inset into it. And so what I first did was I made fabric um, patches and then I sent it and I think I and I actually sewed some of these with with needle and thread and then ran the print and um, then decided you know, so then it came out, but it still had all of these holes in it. And so I went in and recreated the pattern of the lace with thread into the print and, um, and stitched around where I put patches because I could see the memory of that in the ink. And when I was doing these, I was really thinking about the scars that we carry. Um, on our, in our bodies, on our bodies and um, in our psyches and that society carries. And so um, it was interesting to really point, speak to that in this piece. This was a um, collar that um, a friend of mine that I sourced from a friend and um, it was made of cotton and um, this sort of heavy cording. And um, so I printed it, it was quite beautiful. But um, to, get, to get this, I actually had to, when I was cleaning the ink off the press, off the plate, I mean, you know, I had to take the ink out of all of these little holes. So that was fairly painstaking. A lot of Q-tips were used. Um, and then, you know, I finally got it ready and sent it through the press. And I decided um, that in, that where it was torn, 
sort of like I ended up, this I actually did before I did the pandemic runner. Um, I decided to stitch those places and not try to fix it, but actually to sort of make it be part of the pattern, a new pattern. And so this is the final piece. And I also went in with colored pencils in some of these places to deepen some of the color so that it graphically um, worked. This was a pair of knit um, gloves that were quite lovely. And the print that came out of them. And, you know, it was amazing that the, the pattern, I mean, I've worked a lot with knitting, but, you know, this really fine knitting and it just came out really beautifully where you can really see the actual stitches. This was a piece of lace. Um, also that, you know, using the same system. And again, I, I did go in and deepen a lot where it's a little bit darker here. Um, to make the piece work. And then um, the beaded overdress. <laughs> so I have to say that when I first um, asked, you know, was made this proposal, I was thinking that I would get, you know, like table linens and things that had some oomph to them. And, um, and so when I ended up, you know, bringing home these incredibly fragile fabrics. I was, I was sort of like, oh man, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna do this? And um, it reminded me of a story um, of Robert Rauschenberg, who was a painter, printmaker, artist in the um, 1900s. And um, in the 50s or 60s, he went to William de Kooning and said, you know, I'd like to do a piece um, where I erase one of your drawings. And so de Kooning said, well, let me think about that. And a few months later arrived at Rauschenberg's studio and handed him a drawing that he had done with countless different drawing materials. And he said, you can erase this, but it's not gonna be easy. And it's a beautiful piece um, because you, you see that you know, these marks that he couldn't get off. And um, so there were times where I felt like, oh man, <laughs> we'll give you, we'll, we'll deaccession you things, but it's not gonna be easy. So this is that overdress, which was, you know, quite remarkable. And you can see where it's falling apart. And, um, and it was quite large. So it meant I actually had to print on two pieces of paper with two different plates. And, um, and I had one shot. So this is the plate after it went through the press. And you can see all of the ink, all of the fabric that's stuck in the ink and the beads that are stuck on um, the plate. So I literally spent hours, a good part of a day picking ink or picking the fabric out of the ink as much as I could. And there were pieces that I literally couldn't get up without scratching the ink and making even more of a mess. Um, and so this is what I had left of um, the overdress. That was the fabric. And this was the, um, the beads, the tape of beads. <laughs> I laughed a lot <laughs> that day. Um, and then I pulled the print, I cleaned off the press as best I could, or the plate and um, pulled the print. And, you know, you can see these big areas of white, which I was not thrilled about. Um, and, you know, the, you could see where the beads had been. And, and so, you know, I sat with this one for quite a while to figure out what I wanted to do. And, one day I had this idea, well, you know, maybe I could put the beads back on. And, you know, so this was sort of thinking about that idea. And, um, and then I had this idea of taking some of the fabric and bring it and uh, collaging it back onto the print. And then in fact decided to um, 
sew the beads back onto the print and um, to, to, to finish it up that way. It was a labor of love. And that's the final piece. So, um, so that, that, those were, you know, some of the pieces of, of the eight, the 17 total pieces in the show. And um, I just wanted to do a shout out to Rick Cadour, um, or Cassini Cadour, um, and uh, Chris Byrne, who put together the, this book to accompany the exhibition. Um, it's called Mending Fences, The Culture of Repair in, in Art and History. Um, it started out as a 34 page book that morphed into a 92 page um, amazing uh, book about the culture of repair um, and um, uses my work throughout as well as other um, pieces from art history. And um, so this book is actually available through me or through Rokeby or through Cassini House. And um, we can send out links to people if you're um, interested in that. So that is the end of this. Let's stop the sharing. And here I am back. Thanks, Carol. That was fabulous. Um, if anyone has questions, this is the time. Now you can just drop them into the chat. We do have a couple of questions, but before I ask them, I just wanted to say this is, thank you so much, Carol, because it's such a powerful um, body of work that you showed us tonight. Um, one second, let me, so, you know, the metaphor of repair, I think, is really, really deep, and the more you kind of dig into it, um, I just, you know, just get your, your mind rolling, so particularly, you know, when you were talking about scars and, and the idea of um, making the decision that some things are beyond repair, and so you, you talked about that a little bit in your video, um, you know, and it made me think of like conservators at art museums make a decision that they want the object to show its life. And so they decide not to repair or fix certain things. So it just, you know, I, I, that kind of stuck with me when you were um, talking about it. Um, well, and, and an interesting piece about that too is um, that now Rokeby is in the position um, with the pieces that I repaired to actually keep them the way they are now and write me into the provenance. Um, so, you know, we have this decision, do we, you know, reverse the glue or not? And, um, and so that's, a, that's an interesting piece also. Right, to be decided. It reminds yep. me of um, uh, Dora Salcedo, when she went to the Tate Museum, and she says, I want to put a giant crack in your main gallery, and they said, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and they did, the Tate Museum and, and, uh, in London, and so they put a giant crack through the middle of the museum, and then when the exhibition was closed, they filled it in, but that, that crack is still there, right? It never, never goes away. Right. It totally goes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and who knew, um, you know, when I made this proposal that we would be where we are today um, in terms of Black Lives Matter and um, and that I, I you know I feel like work doing for myself personally doing this work was such an awakening to my role as a white person in owning the racism and the discrimination that's happened, um, even though I didn't personally cause it, um, that you know I have benefited from it, and um, and am really actively learning and studying and, and in a class right now about racism and um, to see you know how do we turn this thing around? How how do we move on from here? And, um, and I feel like it's a moment where um, there are many, many white people in my same shoes um, really taking on this issue and that it's, 
It's a huge one, and I don't know what the answer is and how it's going to work out, but um, I feel like there's a groundswell of support to um, to make this different and to make repairs and... Um, right. Um, so we yeah. have a, a related question, and this sure. actually reminds me of... Um, a question that is often asked to my friends who work in art conservation is that in the process of making your work, um, you have to be, it's destructive. So you end up just de destroying some of these historic items. Do you yes. find that, the question is, do you find that ironic given the theme of repair? <laughs> it is, I mean, it is very ironic. Um, uh, and I think, I think that um, there's a way that even that in, re in destroying what was there, that I was able to bring the life of that garment into a new form um, that speaks to the time and becomes a portrait of time and, and enables people to see the garment in a different way than just looking at the garment. So I think that there's something in that process, a, a transformation that happens um, of going from just the actual piece, which, you know, it's like, okay, oh, there's a nice child's dress to, you know, what happens with the print. And, um, and so Rokeby, you know, was very careful about the pieces that they gave me and, and they, um, they gave me pieces that they had other um, pieces similar, but in much better quality. So, um, so yes, it is ironic. <laughs> um, so did, uh, so did the Rokeby Museum, so they made the decision as to what pieces they were going to, or was it a conversation or, or did they, kind of hand you stuff and then you had to make a decision of what you were going to do with it. They pretty much handed me things um, and and then I went to work with them and um, and you know they they gave me I think five pieces and um, and so some of them you know I it was able to do front and back and take out the lining and things and then I also sourced some a lot of the laces um, from Jude Bond, who collects vintage clothing and fabrics, and and Barbara Waters, who had um, the lace piece, and so um, so I I did source some from some other people as well to you know sort of broaden the collection that I was putting together. Right. Um, so touching on that point, um, Kate Higley asks. Did you launder the garments? Were you able to wash them anyway, or were they too fragile? They were too fragile. Um, so, no, I didn't. You know, I, the only thing that I really introduced to water was um, that bonnet that then really fell apart. Um, I did, you know, spray them and iron them if I could. Um, but other than that, no, I didn't try to wash them. <laughs> um, Steve Weatherby makes a comment, as Rokeby strives for preservation versus restoration, I feel like Carol has managed to preserve the spirit of pieces that may have never seen the light of day again. So this is very true. When you're dealing with historic items, a lot of these, like, even ironically prints, um, they're light sensitive. So if you go to a museum, most works on paper, like drawings, prints, that sort of thing, also are like fashion, um, end up in a dark room in order to preserve them and are you know only brought out to light for very small periods of time. So I think it's interesting that um, you know that that connection between both like the printmaking and the historic items of like that act of like in the end, you know, they're they're all gonna fall apart. Um, and so that's that careful walk that you have to walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think there is, let's see, there's some technical questions in here. Um, is there a trick to sewing into paper? Assuming you're using Reese paper, it seems really hard. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, I, so I discovered that if I put the print on my press, on the felt on top of the press bed and, um, and took a needle and poked the holes into the paper, then I could um, bring the needle and thread into it. But I had to pre-poke the holes and, um, and having the felt, you know, heavy felts to be able to um, poke into was very helpful. Thimbles were useful too. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pam says that she notices that you're wearing a lot of red today. Yes. <laughs> so shout out. <laughs> Good observation on Pam. <laughs> Red is the theme, you know. Right. Uh, and she said that she visited the exhibit today with a friend, and it's outstandingly fabulous. So shout out from her. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, they can drop them. I know we're over a little bit because of everything that's going on. Um, so I want to make sure that I get everybody's questions. But once again, Carol, I really appreciate you taking the time to give us this presentation. I know when um, you were telling us about your exhibition, I was like, oh, we have to, it's so perfect for this moment. Um, we have to take the opportunity to, you know, let you talk a little bit about how you did what you did. I know there's several of our printmakers who've worked with, with clothing before, so I know it's challenging not counting the facts when you're working with historic clothing. Um, Lauren says that your work is making me think about consumerism and disposable fashion. Was that something that you had in your mind while you were working on this project? It was, and it is, you know, the, um, like when I grew up, I actually made a lot of my clothing. My mother taught me how to sew. And, um, and by the time my kids were little, it, you know, it was like you couldn't almost couldn't afford to sew somebody's clothing because it, you know, the stuff was so cheap. Um, so I do think about that and I think about the fabrics and we've just gone through a thing with um, Adirondack chairs. You know, we had, we had years ago bought some wooden ones that had finally disintegrated and then we replaced them with those cheap plastic ones, which were great because you can carry them around and they're light, but they've all started breaking. And so I, you know, made this decision. I'm never buying another plastic Adirondack chair in my life. So we just bought four new wind ones that I spent about a week painting and priming and painting. And um, so, yes, I think it's like really important that we think about the fabrics that we're buying, um, you know, and whether they're cotton and whether they'll disintegrate or whether they're nylon or gonna clog up the ocean. And, um, and to really think about what we're buying and, and where it's going, you know, when we can't use it anymore. Um, I think that's a really important consumer issue that mm -hmm. we need to think about. And I know that your this talk focused on your printmaking, but um, I really loved how you worked in like traditions of uh, Japanese um, pottery into like the ceramics and, you know, the idea of like, you know, repairing and reusing loved and cherished objects, so. Yes, yes, I, you know, and so it was, so, it was very multifaceted and um, I had to learn a lot to, to do the repairs that I did. And, um, and uh, so it's been an incredible project and, and you know, feel very honored to um, have gotten the opportunity to be able to work with the collection and pull this project together. I hope it goes further than broke the even. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, just, let's see, one more question. Um, Billy asks, what about the overdress called out to you to make it a labor of love? Was there a point where you thought, maybe I should just give up on this one? <laughs> Um, you know, there, there were, there were, there was a point where I was like, what, you know, how am I going to make this work? And, um, it, you know, it was such a quirky, um, dress to begin with. It was sort of like so different from, 
any other piece. And um, I felt like it spoke to a time and um, that someone had, you know, handmade this piece. And I could imagine somebody actually sort of in the flapper area um, time wearing it, you know, and, 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 and also thinking about, you know, the, the Robinsons were Quakers. And so it was interesting for me to also think about, you know, your, these Quaker women and they, you know, the amount of care that they put into making clothing and being quite fashionable. Um, and, you know, and so it, it was the last print that I pulled because I really was scared about what was gonna happen. And, you know, it was sort of my worst nightmare what happened. And, um, and I like a challenge. And so, um, you know, making that decision, okay, I am going to sew all of these beads on and listen to a lot of podcasts while I do it. And it really became a meditation in doing that. And uh, so, and, and, you know, and it's like one of my favorite pieces now. So. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so one, the very last question. Um, so someone is asking about your relationship with what you did for rugby and your knitted work. So like behind you, I see one of your beautiful knitted prints. So you're, you're known for using textiles and knit in your work. Mm -hmm. Um, so did that play into, did that help inform a little bit of what you were doing or is it much different usually when you work with your knitted pieces? Well, I learned so much of how to work with inks and, um, transfer, you know, different fibers into print. So that was hugely helpful to me. And earlier on in my career, um, I guess in like the early 80s, I had done a series of pieces that were sort of portraits of me through the clothing that I wore. So I've had a relationship of um, working with clothing before. Um, so I feel like, you know, everything that you've done as an artist always comes into play with any project that you take on. And really when I started this project, I really wasn't sure, you know, how it was gonna turn out. So I just knew I had the idea and I've come to trust in my process enough to realize that if I just keep with my idea that something's going to happen and it will, you know, turn into something. So fortunately it did. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's it for tonight. So just one last plug for, for Carol's show. Um, you know, if you go to the Rope Bee Museum website, it has a lot more information. Um, and then we will be uh, editing the two parts of tonight's talk together and posting the recording online. Um, so we hope to see you soon. We'll also be emailing out a survey. So let us know because we're as we plan new programming, we'd love to hear you guys' feedback. So once again, thank you for sticking with us tonight. Um, and we hope to see you soon. Anything you want to add, Carol? No, thank you so much for coming. It's great to um, see people. I, I can't see everybody, but hi, Billy. <laughs> Shout out to you. And, um, and will we be sending an email to people who were to let them? Who yeah, we're, we'll, we'll email everybody on the list. Um, so they'll have a, a copy of the recording and, and, and uh, also it'll have links to your website and to the exhibition and uh, the exhibition is on view through the end of October, correct? Yes, well, October 25th. Perfect. Great. Yes, they're open every day. So hope you can get there. And, um, and thanks so much for coming and zooming in here with us.